So if you heard my podcast episode with Travis Steffens, which by the way, if you haven't, I highly, highly recommend super inspiring human being, Travis. Um, This is someone, today's guest is someone who I was introduced to through Travis posting about him um, and saying, this guy's been a huge influence in my life, mentor, and he's got this book uh, called Swords of Illumination. And I was like, anybody that Travis respects and has had an influence in his life has got to be amazing. So I reached out um, and asked if I could interview our guest today. And his name is David C. Alcott. Let me tell you a little about him. This, by the way, I'll just say right now, this book is blowing me away. Full disclosure, I haven't finished it yet because I waited too long to start reading it before the interview because that's how I roll. (laughs) But I am like, it is a page turner. I am dying over how good it is. So I cannot recommend enough. Wow. But um, David is the president and CEO of Samurai Success Inc., an international executive, organizational, and personal coaching form firm headquartered in Denver, Colorado. He has more than 35 years of professional coaching experience. Um, he, I mean, he's a nationally known motivational speaker and lecturer. Uh, prior to founding Samurai Success, he was the number one national trainer for Tony Robbins and was the business manager for the number one selling real estate agent in the world. Um, and he's also s- served as chief of staff or a member of the Florida State Senate, you know, so he's been around in like some, a lot of success circles, I'll put it that way. And he's, you know, coached and mentored and spoken in a lot of influential success circles. And so I think you'll see as he speaks, I mean, he's drinking from the good cup, that's for sure. <laughs> What I mean by that is like, he's getting, I don't know how else to say, it, but he's getting his information like straight from source, you know, <laughs> and it's very obvious as he's talking and, um, this book, which he does describe as coming through him is very, it's very obviously that way. And I can't recommend it enough. I just ordered the hard, there's a hardcover copy. I got just ordered it for my 16 year old son. I'm excited to have him read it. I think he's going to love it. So it might make a really, really great gift. If you're looking for a gift that's very inspiring and a super enjoyable page turner, it's it's story format. It's held in feudal Japan, right? So it's like, but it, I usually don't really, I, I told him, I was like, I usually don't really like story kind of books. I'm like an information book kind of person, but I am blown away by this book. It is incredible. I really recommend getting it. It's um, Swords of Illumination. We'll link it up in the show notes and I'll stop ranting now. Just want to let you guys know, like, Wowie, wow, wow. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Here is David C. Alcott. All right. So, David, I was so grateful that Travis Steffens posted about you and your book. Um, I knew that when I saw that you were a mentor to him, that you must be a pretty incredible person. We had Travis on a few episodes ago. Um, and I'm in the middle of your book. I full, you know, full disclaimer, I haven't finished it. And I was telling Dave before we started, I'm like, I'm so grateful that you've taken the time to come and share your wisdom with my audience. And I'm also really excited to get back to reading when this is done. (laughs) (laughs) it is a it let me say this this book is not only so profound and i'm having all these aha moments in in terms of my business in terms of my personal life and all of that it's also a page turner really enjoyable to read and i will say there's there's a story right there's a, a story in it and i'm not usually a story person like i'm kind of that like i want the factual nonfiction. Right. like just feed it to me straight to my brain and for me to be this in love with a book that's told in story format like that like it is an exceptional book full of so many men- metaphors and lessons and aha moments and easy application to our own lives and so let's backtrack a little bit um, you've had a long career of coaching, you know, a leader to leaders, a mentor to leaders, um, you know, helping people transform their businesses and their lives. What was the inspiration for this book? Why did you write it this way? And can you tell us a little bit about it, what people might expect? Sure. And Tara, as we get going with this, I just really want to thank you for your amazing work with us. Travis has spoken and Travis doesn't do this with me. He, 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 he keeps me away from people that, you know, just doesn't <laughs> fits or align with kind of stuff. And when he talks about you and what you've done with us, it's truly remarkable. So thank you for Thanks. everything you're doing for the planet <laughs> and for Thanks. all of us. So thank you. Really. Thank you. Um, yeah. Interesting background for sure of, of meeting some interesting people, but the real precipice behind this was, and I was just tired of things not working. Mm. 
And I went through a portion of my life where I was having this amazing life. I grew up in the Florida Keys. Mm. I've spent more of my life underneath the water than I have on top of it up to about 29 years old. I mean, literally, I was diving wow. every day, wow. uh, spearfishing and things like this. Came out, went to school, played by all the rules, student government, did all play. I mean, I, people just told me the rules. I was just writing them down. I was like, I can right. do that. And this is going to make me successful. And it wasn't. It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I trained with the best people I could find. I've always sought after the best coaches. Very thankful for all those things. But something was missing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> there was one thing that guided me through this whole thing. I knew without a shadow of a doubt, just a knowingness, you know, that knowingness that you get in your mm -hmm. soul. Mm -hmm. There was no way that a loving God would ever put me here alone without some kind of direction. Mm. I knew that. Didn't always remember it, but I knew it. <laughs> you know, those places you get in that darkness, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, enough is enough. I have to find out how this place works. Wow. I have to find out how I work, how this physical plane works. And then how the universe works. And I will tell you, you could spend an entire lifetime on just any one of those three things. Yeah. And what I found was the Holy Grail, the, the thing that moves both this physical plane and the universe is you and I. We are that important to this entire metrics or matrix. Mm. You and I have a huge responsibility in this, not only just special, but we have human technology that drives this physical plane and directs the universe. Mm. People have heard this in lots of different terms. You've heard about it as the attractor factor, right? Yeah. Thing. And years ago, a book came out around the secret and, you know, how right. we, you know, ask the universe, this universal catalog for information. There is something so unique with us because we have the ability to take something from nothing and turn it into something. And in the spiritual terms, that's called manifestation. Taking something that doesn't exist and believing in it so completely yeah. that we turn it into something. <laughs> we actually can lower its vibration out of the world of pure potentiality, an idea, and make it. That is unique to you and I on this planet. There is no other species on this planet or in this galaxy that I know of that can do that. <laughs> okay, Dave, that sounds really good. How? <laughs> <laughs> and that's where my journey really began. And that was the inspiration behind this book is finding out because I knew there was a roadmap for this. I didn't have to create it. All this stuff that we talk about in the self-help thing is, let me tell you how I did this and how I right. did this. This has been here for as long as there's been humans here. Mm -hmm. It would have been placed here for us so that we could discover it. And that's what this book is about. Mm -hmm. It's about discovering those elements that allows us as this human technology to create things. And so reading everything I could get my hands on, learning from the best masters on the planet, going to work with some of these people, studying them, interviewing, talking to everybody I could. You'd be weird. You know, I'd be in the grocery store. If I saw you and I thought you looked like success, I'm talking to you. It's like, nice. what are you doing? Because every single one of us has a piece of this puzzle. Mm. And I was reading through this, Sarah, and what the amazing part about it was that all of a sudden, there was this thing that started happening. I was reading all these books, going to all these seminars, listening to all these people, interviewing and stuff like this. And then I started having this conversation as, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, I've heard that before. And I started getting disappointed. I was like, ah, you know, I'm not hearing anything new. Mm. And that was the breakthrough. Wow. This wasn't new. This has been here since we started here. It's always been here for us. And there are elements to being able to create this manifestation. Really important about this, and you learn this in the book as you go through it, that we have this primary belief system, not only just in Western Hemisphere, but on this planet, that knowledge is power. 
I can understand where we came from that, but we've misinterpreted it. Knowledge in itself without application is not power. Because no. I meet people that are incredibly brilliant and they have the source code of information. They just ramble on about stuff and yet they're right. not successful. Right. Now, whatever success is, and we're going to talk a little about that, how we define that. But then you turn over here and you go, how in the hell is that person doing it? Right. They don't have all this knowledge this person hasn't. And then you start contrasting things and you start looking for what started to become themes. That mm -hmm. stuff that I told you about where I was just getting, you know, frustrated and bored with, I was hearing it over and over again. Those were the secrets. <laughs> and I started realizing there were themes. Mm. And those themes, when I started talking to people and I was having those themes in my head, as I was talking to people, I started hearing the themes from them. Like, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps right now because that was that moment that I started realizing people on this planet are intuitively in touch with what's in that book. And for all the people who have spoken to us about the book, they're like, this is such a fun book to read. And it, it just, it does this. And it just reminded me of everything I already know. And it's, it's exactly <laughs> right because the things that are going to change this planet aren't something new. It's applying what we already know. <laughs> yeah. Recreating the wheel doesn't seem like the most, if you know, you can, we can apply new, uh, creative ideas that flow in into us to the wheel. Like, Hey, that might be kind of cool. If you put some rubber around this thing, it might like protect the actual wheel part a little bit, you know, but <laughs> it's like, let's try a triangle wheel. Let's try a square wheel. You know, it's like, well, you know, we could also just build upon the knowledge that's already there and available to us. And I want to get into this with you because I can tell that you're, you're coming from this place. Cause there's, there's, there's a part in the prologue. It's I'm going to read it. It says for years, I stopped listening. It was like, you, you talking about not living up to your destiny, feeling like you weren't living up to your destiny. You said for years, I stopped listening to this feeling and went about life. Like so many others doing the things we seem to think are important, getting the job, getting the money, getting the spouse, et cetera. But no matter how hard I tried to stop that feeling, it kept coming back. As a matter of fact, each time it seemed to come back harder, even to say it was haunting me. That really resonated with me. Um, and I want to kind of get into this topic of like creating your destiny, discovering your destiny, which is a major theme in the book. Can you share your thoughts on that? <laughs> One of the huge breakthroughs that not only shows up in the book, but also in my life personally, was that in all the movies, books, stuff, and I'm a huge movie fan. I love movies. I mean, that it was always this thing like this destiny had already been created for you and you had mm -hmm. to go find that destiny or the destiny was going to find you, but you had to do something to be able to go get, you know, have this destiny happen to you. And as I was going through it, I was not finding that same belief system storyline in people that were actually being successful. <laughs> I was like, there's conflict here that doesn't make sense. Right. I, mm. I couldn't figure it out. Mm. And then I had to let go of that belief system and then just observe what was really happening. Yeah. And what was really happening was the people that were being successful knew this thing. It's the very first sword in the book. The thing that makes the difference isn't you finding your destiny. It's creating that destiny. And the way you do that is creating your identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was a huge impact. 1970s, there was a gentleman named John Denver. I don't know if you're familiar with him and his work, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's one of the, probably the reasons I live in Colorado because he, <laughs> okay. you know, growing up, he's how the hell did you get to call it? John Denver? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but he was one of the first huge mega store in my lifetime. Now, Elvis had been before me kind of stuff, but John Denver was this, and he was such a folksy guy and such wholesome and humble. And I mean, mm. I loved everything about this guy and his voice. Mm. He just didn't imagine that angelic voice coming out of that man. You just, <laughs> you were blown away at every aspect. And then he got movies and everything else. And I remember an interview with him that haunts me even today, that when he were talking about how he created uh, some of his songs and he would mm -hmm. always say the same thing in different verbiage, but same theme. It just came to me. It's like the song already existed. 
he had to get to a place that he could hear it. Mm. Now, there's been prodigies on our planet that have been very successful. Mozart's a great example. And they have said that when you see some of Mozart's music, it's like he was taking dictation. He was just writing what he heard. So that has to exist somewhere for you to hear it. Mm -hmm. To not get too far down this idea of quantum mechanics down the rabbit hole. But there's science behind this now that talks about this. And again, this is theoretical, so stay with me on it. <laughs> but there's this world of pure potentiality where everything already exists. And if I can figure out a way for me to attune to mm -hmm. that space, then I can pull that information here through me. And that's what the most successful people do. How they do that is knowing who they are, creating who they are, and then being congruent through every single action that they do on this physical plane. And when you do that, it's about congruency, not consciousness, is what I'm finding in my life that creates this opportunity for us as human beings to connect to source and pull heaven on earth. <laughs> I was just saying this last night. I was talking to a friend um, trying to get their business kind of going off the ground. And they're like, everybody has all these different, you know, suggestions. Right. And I was like, well, I guess I have one too. And I like just sat in like meditation. Pose right. and I was just like, this is where I would get all your suggestions. That's where I get mine. <laughs> just ask. <laughs> Open up. Because so much of the work of coaching and supporting other people is about me telling you what to do. Me telling you my suggestion. The thing with the best coaches on the planet is how the hell you get the hell out of the way so that you don't bring your stuff to them. They've got enough of their own stuff. They don't need yours. <laughs> your job as a human being, and especially if you're going to be in the coaching field, mm -hmm. is to work on you and yep. only you. Yep. So you can get out of the way to truly be in service to another. Yeah. It's just like that, you know, sort of identity, right? So we're to give you guys some context, this, the setting of the book is in like feudal Japan. It's a, it's a story of a samurai, right? So when we're talking about swords, these all come into play in this like beautifully told story, but that first identity sword that this uh, character Yoshi gets this young man is who am I in this moment? Right. And I, and I read that and I was like, man, if you, if I just ask myself that all the time, all <laughs> like anytime I'm feeling triggered, you know, and he goes into, he's challenged with this, right. He's, he's tempted to, you know, somebody, it reminded me of me on social media when somebody's like, right. well, this is out of your scope. And why are you even saying this? And this is wrong. And you're going to hurt people and you should, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, okay, who am I in this moment? Who am I in this moment? Who am I in this moment? Even when somebody's coming at me or, when I, you know, my wounds are getting triggered and I feel, you know, I'm taking somebody else's stuff and I'm making it about me. Like they're being like that to me, you know, and I'm getting in those wounded behaviors. Ooh, that reminder, who am I? And, I? and I'm more curious if you can go a little deeper into this. Um, in terms of, I know that in my experience, some people, this is the first question I ask in my and my coaching, the very first question that my clients get in their, you know, little personal growth program is who are you? Mm, nice. and, <laughs> Good Good for and, you. and I can tell a lot by how they answer that. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, this identity, who am I, you know, can you share some of your insights into, I don't know, being able to healthy, healthily really learn that for yourself? You know, any suggestions to people? Well, lots of suggestions with it, but really to focus on this, the very first thing to understand is that you're going to work from two different places in this world. You're either going to work from an identity statement that it was created by other people. Mm. They could have very well been very well-meaning good people in your life, or they could have been not so good meaning people in your life, but they're going to help you create your identity. <laughs> or you're going to self-create your identity. 
And I will tell you the massive amount of successful people on this planet choose this one as opposed to the other. And then they live that life congruently and to a point where no one else can talk them out of it. That is a remarkable Mm -hmm. gift. And it's available to you and I and everybody else on this planet. Mm -hmm. If we took the time that we spend watching these channels and, you know, all the different YouTube stuff and all the different social media stuff, we just took that time and just worked on who I say I am, my identity. Do you, this place would change overnight yeah. and I'm not being facetious. I'm not being dramatic. Here. True. It would literally change overnight what? because once you understand that you, this, the only thing you really get to create on this planet is who you say you are. Everything else has been created already and it exists in the world of pure potentiality. Mm. No one has created electricity. No one created this thing called right. a V8 engine or and when Ford was struggling to bring that forth, every single engineer on the planet was telling him, you can't build that. Mm. And of course that V8 engine isn't just about all these different cars today. We're starting to phase it out, but that was this thing he brought forth from an idea of everybody telling him no. <laughs> Disney. We could go through a list of every mm-hmm. single person who has been in their lifetime attempted to talk out of who they really are, and everybody's attempted to do it. The ones who have been successful do not allow others to talk them out of it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how in the hell do they do that? And here it is. They have a belief because they understand something called the law of polarity. Mm law of contrast. Mm. And in that law of contrast, in order for you and I as a human being to come here and do what we've really come here to do, which is about having experiences of things, in order to have an experience, the opposite of what you say you are must exist. Yep. If I want to know myself as tall, someone has to be shorter than me. Right. If I want to know left, I got to know right. If right. I want to know light, I got to know darkness. The law of contrast allows you and I as human beings to experience things. And without that, you could not do that. Right. So these successful people take that belief system and realize when someone's attacking you, you cannot be you without that wonderful forgetting themselves and who they are soul to come into your life and attack you Mm -hmm. in any way, shape, form there, because without that, You cannot be who you say you are. Mm. Now you think about that for a minute. Then you start to realize that's why they don't get affected like you and I. They don't get hooked. They don't get triggered the same way because they have this belief system about who they are. And then they become thankful for those people. Yeah, awesome. Right. The master said, love thy enemies. Yeah. They see it as affirming it's Fine. more of a boost. <laughs> Who I am. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the reminder. I'm doing some right. <laughs> right. Awesome. Okay. Um, there's some other quotes in here that I, I've just been writing things down um, as I go, just stuff I want to remember in the book. Um, there's a there's a point where there's a monk. And the Mm. monk, the the young man has gotten to a place. I don't want to spoil the whole book, but the monk says, and they say that this was, I don't know if this is an actual like famous adage or something, but I loved it. And it says, uh, the monk said, it may seem difficult at first, but everything is difficult at first. Mm. What a profound line. What a profound thing to remember, right? You know, it's like, let's say you want to lose weight or you want to build a business or, you know, (laughs) anytime you're trying something new, I'm like, if we were all super great at something the at the, in the beginning, we would all be Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Andre Agassi, Serena Williams, you know, <laughs> it's, and so it's, there's little, there's little parts in the book all throughout. It's just like, it's like every single page just is like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm, good. The good thing to know, you know, so if you get the book, which I really recommend you do really. And if I would say too, I bought the hardcover book because I want to give it to my 16 year old son. And oh, then I want okay. his 13 year old brother and then his 11 year old brother to read it after him, you know, you understand our audience. <laughs> yeah. Like very important. I'm going to be checking in, make sure they're reading. I think they'll love it. Um, but it's that it's just like the little lessons you can tell you've been doing this a long time because it's just this masterful way of teaching. And you said something to me before we got started that I wanted to hit on that note. 
Like, you, I mean, you, co you've been coaching forever. You, you, you've, you know, done, you've done all the, all the big things you're, you go in, you're a trainer, you're a speaker, you know, all this stuff. I'm very fascinated with the way that you chose to write this book. It is really like a, a, a work of art. It, it's like a very literally well done literary book. It's not just like a, here's a mindset. Here's what you need to know, that kind of stuff. Can you go in a little more into why you chose to do it this way? Okay. Well then let me get as selfish as I possibly can. Um, the reason I really wrote this book was for me. <laughs> awesome. Um, You're I'm backing up what you just said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I got to tell you that there's a part of me that knows I've been here before. I know that sounds strange, but oh, not to it, me. <laughs> it resonates terrible with me. Like I have that's that destiny you were talking about. I know I've been here before. Wow. And when I come back, because I've obviously been here before, I want that book to be here for me. Wow. I want to pick that book up. And you know what would excite me? <laughs> Is if one of your children got hold of that book and evolved it even further than it is. And then became my teacher when I came back. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Wow. That yeah. was a much more beautiful answer than I ever could have expected. <laughs> Sorry about that. But <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Straight from your heart, this book, straight from your soul. Wow. Well, there's the beautiful way of saying that because that book didn't come from me. That book came through me. Mm. That's an honor to John Denver and everything else because when you, when that, when I read that book and it touches me again, after I've read it so many times writing and all that stuff, it doesn't matter. It touches me. I, I learn so much from it every single time. And that's what I've always wanted to be able to bring forth. And that was my commitment to the universe that once I was taught these things, I was going to share it with everyone. <laughs> I say the same thing. Sometimes I say, I think the universe has been really generous with me. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, she'll share for sure. She'll tell <laughs> everybody. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and give her all the resources and the, uh, go ahead and she'll, 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 she'll do it. She'll do whatever no. it takes to share it. <laughs> Just cause it's yeah. who you are. <laughs> yeah. Cause it brings me joy to share it. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to deep it, you know, and I, I, I have those conversations with my guides or source or however you want to put it. It's just like, I'm here. I mean, I got, thank you for this wonderful body and my health and like, I, whatever you need, like, just let me know. I would, I would love be honored to serve however you want, you know, whatever, whatever's needed. But it also comes in like a, um, to me, those kind of moments, spiritual, spiritually connected moments come in an energy of a lot of like mutual respect is how I feel it. Like, it's not necessarily like just a, here's what you need to do, Tara. I, the stuff does come in like that. And I'm so grateful. I'm like, wow, thank you. Wow. <laughs> and also like, I feel seen and appreciated and respected also from that source is a really cool, been a cool experience. And that leads me to my next question. Like, I don't even know how I would answer this, but we'll see what you got. Like, what do you think that you, how in your life do you feel that you have cultivated yourself to be in an energy in which things can work through you like that? And that's the, that's the thing we talked about just a little bit was I was really convinced for most of my life that I had to increase my level of consciousness and I had to be able to figure out the spiritual path and to be able to raise your consciousness, you had to be good and you had to do good. And that wasn't fitting with what I was seeing mm. because I found a lot of people that weren't doing what I would consider good. And yet they were being successful. Mm. How is that happening? Mm. And I, I read some remarkable work by Dr. David Hawkins, who created the map of consciousness. Yeah. Beautiful. And he was really clear in his work about saying that while we're here, we come in with a level of consciousness and you're only going to increase that by maybe five points. And I was like, I mean, seriously, I dropped the book. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, I was raged. I was like, not me, yes. not me, Dr. Hawkins. I'm going to I'm I'm need to go into that conversation, I guess, because we're recording just kidding. This. <laughs> moving on. Um, I was just, I was flabbergasted, but I, it, 
it resonated with me. Mm-hmm. And that's what mm-hmm. really got to me. It was like, oh, damn it. So what else is there? If I'm not here to raise my consciousness, mm-hmm. what else is there? And then I started looking for this difference between this congruency, mm-hmm. knowing who you are, being who you are, and doing that what aligns with us. And you and I know that term is authenticity. Yeah. The universe knows it as being centered, hmm. not balanced, hmm. centered. Hmm. And in the world of martial arts that I've been spending most of my life, when you get centered, you are a different force of nature. So in yoga, when you can truly not get balanced, but get centered, like your breath, your mind, your body, your soul are centered and aligned and authentic. Oh, it's a totally different experience. True. Wow. What kind of things do you see knock us off that center? Just oh. the voices of others, <laughs> the distractions, the wo- unhealed wounds. Like what do you, what are some big hitters for you for like, cause we, we all know what you're talking about right now. We have all in one way, shape or form. Maybe it was when you were doing something athletic and you were just fully centered in the zone. Like you're like, I see the, how the outcome of this is going and boom, you know, like it, maybe it's physical or maybe it's yeah. In certain areas of my career, I have just been so centered. Like I understand what I need to do and this is happening and boom, boom, boom. You know, we understand that we've had moments or, or I hope everyone's had moments of understanding that. Um, I'm always curious to see like, what are the, uh, experience of other coaches, especially ones that have been doing it for so long, like you in terms of like big hitter contributions that keep us from being able to be in that place. Because I, I believe that place that you're talking about is like our true nature. Yes. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. And it's interesting about our true nature because in, in our world, we talk about this thing that, you know, well, in the book, you're starting to find out that you get to create your identity and that identity stays with you for as long as it does, because we're swimming in this big giant vat, this ocean <laughs> of forgetfulness juice. <laughs> well said. <laughs> and how do you explain that to somebody? I mean, how does a fish explain to another fish the other swimming in this ocean? You don't see it. You don't notice it. But right. if there's one thing that I've met with every single human being does on this planet is we forget. Yeah. Every single one of us does this in different ways. The ones who do not forget who they are, are the ones who are the most successful. And I started seeing this correlation over and over again. It's like, holy crap. So how do they stay who they are? And by the way, they forget it just as much as us, but then they go back to it. So this idea here is that the brain is actually a programmable event. It actually has hardware Mm -hmm. and your verbiage is the software for that hardware. So the things that we're talking to ourselves, going back to your original question, what throws us off center? There is nothing on this planet that throws you off center more than you. Yeah. Yeah. So all this healing work we're talking about, all this stuff we're wanting to be able to deal with all these past traumas and all of us have them. Mm -hmm. Some more degrees of difficulty and fierceness and terror Mm -hmm. that everyone Mm -hmm. could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. especially what's going on with the planet now. But that has to be something that we take in and say, how do I heal that? Mm -hmm. Healing that is remembering who you are. Mm -hmm. When you remember that you are divinity, all this stuff starts to fade very quickly. Right. All this physical stuff. Right. So as long as we stay in touch with the source, Mm -hmm. that stuff heals very fast. (laughs) <laughs> so if you're really after acceleration of healing, getting reconnected to something bigger than you, and you can call it whatever you like, but there's a source within each and every one of us, a master inside of each one of us, that when you can connect to that and that soul connection to source heals everything. It's just staying in that space for longer periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see like, I get taught visually a lot and I like intuitively, and I was seeing like 
you talked about polarity, right? And we see, and I like a, I don't know, how would I say it? Like I get intuitively guided on some like lessons I need to really kind of like learn and focus on. And one of them was, um, actually came through a breathwork session. So a little nice. plug for breathwork <laughs> with uh, yes. Travis. So this, this was a separate one, you know, one of those like one hour long ones, but it was like, Tara, remember if you, if you love earth life and you love joy and happiness and human connection and enlightenment and peace and all these things, then if you're not equally loving greed, anger, devastation, grief, you don't get it. Well said. Because you can't have the, all this shiny, wonderful stuff without that. Otherwise it just doesn't exist, you know? And the way I see it in terms of what you're talking about is like, when I, for me, I feel like, you know, fear, anger, greed, some of these lower conscious things that Dr. Hawkins talks about. I just see those as separation from source, like a, a, like a feigned separation, our own separation from source. And then like the closer we are to source, the more those things just dissipate. Like you said, like this accelerated, like, oh, <laughs> I was so in fear because I forgot as you pointed out, I forgot who I am and I forgot what I just know innately in myself, you know? So that's very much resonating with me. Okay. I have another little quote. If you, I hope you don't mind me pulling this extra oh. from your book. This was so great. Um, so, so let me go back to, by the way, I'm sorry. Oh, to, no, please. The quote that you used earlier is centuries old. Okay. That's what I everything, wondered. Everything is difficult in the beginning. It's actually by one of the most famous samurai of all time. Okay. Okay. So that's a direct quote from his work. That was from who, name, what was his Musashi. name? Okay. Musashi. Yeah. Okay. You in the book, you yeah. he talks about Yoshi's connection with Musashi okay. is one of the great samurais of the right. time and as a philosopher. So going back to this really quickly, samurai loosely translated means in service of others. Mm. Now, if you want to live the greatest life that has ever been spoken about, being in service of others is that. (laughs) Being samurai in our world, and that's why we named our company Samurai Success, in service of your success. Mm. To truly become samurai in this new field isn't about wielding around a sword. I practice this stuff and I do this martial arts stuff, but we don't walk around with swords these days kind of things. I'm not Asian, obviously. But to become an embodied samurai, it's about truly being in service of others. And we talked about before, you've got to work on you, which is totally against Western philosophy that says, no, no, you've got to get out there and help everybody else. If you don't work on you, you will never get to the center you and I are talking about. And everything will knock you off center. Yeah, yeah. Everything is designed to do that. Because this law of contrast exists and you're swimming in it every single day. There's the light and the dark and both are divinity. Mm -hmm. They are not separate from each other. Mm -hmm. And that's the next level that I'd love to talk to you about, which is this and that as opposed to the world that you and I live in, which is this or Or, that. Right. And in the book, it speaks directly about that Mm -hmm. contrast and how to start taking that contrast and realizing it's one thing (laughs) how to stay centered in that is you being clear about who you are Mm -hmm. and doing everything from that state of being so it's an important thing to really get centered about is that's why you have done so well in your life because in those critical moments you stay centered more than other people do Mm -hmm. we all have this access to this we all have this ability It's just remembering these things and then getting clear is I need to stop doing all this auxiliary stuff and I need to work on me Mm -hmm. again that you you can't do that. That's self-love and you're not supposed to take care of you and all the programming and all the stuff we've been sold in these stories Mm -hmm. don't really work. Mm -hmm. The biggest priority for me has been become to have time for me to mm, not be busy. Mm. time yep. for me to walk around, you know, yesterday I had some time in my schedule. I just caught no, no, no incoming. I'll have some, sometimes I just feel the need for no incoming noise, no, not even music, like nothing incoming. Let's just be, you know, and I was folding clothes and just really slowly moving for four hours, 
you know, just in silence. And it was so beautiful and little things would come through and I'm like, Oh, thank you. You know? And then back to just blank, you know? And I, to me, that's like the exact opposite of, I think what a lot of us are told is like, you got to grind, baby, you got to work hard. And sometimes you do have to, sometimes it's, it's important to be able to access that. Whoa. Like, can I stay centered when there's a lot going on too? Yes. And that's important to access too. I don't want to be in that all the time though. Cause it's, um, it's just a lot easier for me. Anyway, it's a lot easier to hear mm-hmm. and have things work through me. The more calm and silence I can have, <laughs> you know, it's just easier to hear. <laughs> I think Yoshi actually does the practice in the book, right? Mm-hmm. That you're reading, and this is getting out of mind. Is nice. he has a practice of what you are talking about? Right? <laughs> By the way, you and I have never met before this, so yeah, how are we having these shared experiences because these have been around forever. Yeah, right. I was I was taught these things. I yeah. you know, heard little yeah. Ram Dass said, "You are not your thoughts." What? What? I'm not my thoughts. <laughs> Let me go on a month long obsession with that one. Right. <laughs> and he didn't. That wasn't new to him either. He was taught that, you know. And it just keeps coming through. And if you're tuned, those things really ring out, you know. And then yeah, there is some practice, right? Like there's a the practice that comes through, which I'm sure I'm about to embark on because he just got to his school here. So I, there's a lot of good stuff coming. And speaking of that, this part where I'm at in the book. Um, so basically to kind of give you guys a little context, I don't want to like spoil it, but they're swords. Okay. He has a sword. That's all I'm going to say. It's really cool how he gets the sword. And that's all I'm going to say. So there's a sword and it's got something engraved, like a message on it. And then he, I'm really, am I spoiling it too much, David? I I go for it. Okay. Come on. <laughs> It's like really, really cool and exciting. And he gets to this like school that it's like hard to find. He's got this little old map. And anyway, he gets there and he, they, it's, I'm at the part where um, they show him the other, that there's more than one sword. Okay. So he's in that room. And I love this quote. Um, Cause he said, um, uh, where do I start? He said, um, once you have, he's finding out that the, he, that he will, get another sword. He thought this was the only sword that he would ever get. This was his special yeah. sword. Right. <laughs> and the, and the guy says, once you have demonstrated the knowledge of the sword, once you have demonstrated the knowledge of the sword and more importantly, the application of that knowledge, the, the sword will be taken from you and you'll be invited to accept the next sword of illumination. I thought I was like, that is such a great reminder. I'll let you elaborate. You know, what is that? What is, how does that apply to us in your opinion? <laughs> so there's a, a huge belief system in our society that says knowledge is power. And <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with that full heartedly, but I will tell you that I've met a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge mm-hmm. and they're not, they're not living their life of destiny. They're not feeling mm-hmm. successful, they're not feeling fulfilled. They're not feeling purposeful. They're not jumping out of bed, you know, excited every single day for their lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's call that some level of success. So they're not in their own minds being sick. They've gathered all this knowledge mm-hmm. based upon that belief system. Mm-hmm. And it really goes ar- away from one of the primary reasons we're here is to have an experience of things. So if you just have knowledge and you don't apply the knowledge, then you're not going to have that experience that the universe has set up for us here. Mm-hmm. One of the primary reasons we're here is to have experiences of who we say we are. Yep. And without that application or demonstration, you don't get to that place. So mm-hmm. we hoard things. Mm-hmm. We don't just hoard material stuff and collect stuff. We hold on to knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I bought into this for a long period of mm-hmm. time in my own life because I was like, oh, I just got that piece of information. I'm writing it down. And by the way, I was right. seriously writing stuff down and putting stuff away and gathering. And, and then I was like, all this stuff was coming from me. Now, it wasn't mine, but I said it was mine mm-hmm. you know, just because mm-hmm. my ego was involved. Mm-hmm. And I was just taking all that stuff. And then I'd have these funny cliches and notes and Chinese, uh, you know, cookie cutter things that I would say out loud. And I was like, God, I'm so impressive. And and what was it doing <laughs> to change anything? Or it wow. wasn't, wow. I wasn't fulfilled. I was like, I'm not, I'm not contributing. I'm not bringing wow. something forth. I'm just being a parrot. Wow. Had all this knowledge, mm. but wasn't experiential. Mm-hmm. Knowledge without experience 
she usually shows up as arrogance. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I was living. And I finally had enough. I was just like, this isn't working. Now I'm fortunate enough to have that happen very early in my life mm-hmm. so that I could make that transition mm-hmm. and go and embark on a different quality of life. That's why I'm speaking so much about this now, but cause I know both paths and I was like, ah, but instead of coming from me, I found that way to come through me. Mm-hmm. And the weird part about it is the more I give it away, the more stuff I have access to. And that mm-hmm. is power for me mm. because when I meet someone new and I'm just having it come through, I, it comes through me the perfect thing to say to them. And sometimes I don't even remember it. Yeah. Right. It's just like, what the hell just happened? Did I say, did I really just say, did anybody write that down? Mm-hmm. <laughs> someone capture that. Cause it's usually profound. It's mm-hmm. remarkable and it yeah. doesn't come for me. Yeah. That's how I do all my coaching before I get on calls. I just, yep. just nice. get connected and just trust and just like really listen. Like I wish there was a better word than listen. It's just like really attune myself to that person and trust, you know, and that's, that's how I do it. And I'm often reminded also like, <clears throat> Like right now I'm doing some restructuring in my business and, you know, I'm in those creative stages and I just keep getting these only from your heart, only here. As soon as it comes up into here, just take a second, come back here straight from your soul. What do you think? Not the way that you've done it or the way other people do it or the great, the way, no, let that go. Okay. Come back. You know, that's how I'm doing it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it takes, it takes a second, you know, it takes a second sometimes to, to, I think, um, repattern some of those things in different areas of our lives, you know, but if you just stay here, that's where all the good stuff is for sure. And you know, what you just said, your last point, uh, is so perfect because I had written here my last like mic drop from your book that I wrote down is, uh, he asked, how he said the sword's not mine to keep when he found out that he was going to get other ones. And, um, uh, the monk says this, this, the sword will always be with you and that you will always, sorry, you will be able to use the knowledge you take from it. But we believe knowledge is strengthened when it can be shared. And that's, that's samurai success. That's the company you've created. And it's so true. And it got me thinking about like, how can I help mentor the people that I'm mentoring to encourage, to allow space? How can I create space and create an opportunity for them to share what they've learned also, because it is strengthened when we're able to do that, you know? And, um, I guess we'll kind of close this off with like, first of all, man, thank you for just showing up in the way that you've shown up in life. First of all, it's seen and appreciated. Second, I can definitely see why Travis loves you. Third, um, thank you for taking the time to write that book and like be in a place in which you could write it so beautifully. And guys like, I mean, I'm the one who reached out to David about this. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm highly encouraging you to re- get this book. And if you've got I mean, for anyone, but I would say like, if you got teenage boys or like younger, you know, 20 something year olds, or shoot, even if you're 60 and you're reading that, like it, it will impact you. It will impact you. So definitely really encouraging you guys to get the book. We'll link it up. Um, and, Oh, sorry. The book is now I'm the sword swords of illumination. Is there like a subtitle? Yes. Sword, or, no. no, no subtitle swords subtitle. of illumination. It's kind of secret, David. It's kind of see. It's kind of fits the book. Like it's like if I went on to Amazon or something, I would have no idea <laughs> what was in here. It's kind of it fits the vibe for sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would just wanted to kind of close it up by like just asking you a little bit about uh, samurai success. You know, to kind of tie it to the book. Like, um, you've got your. I'm going to say it wrong. My daughter speaks Mandarin. So she's always like, mom, don't say it like that. It's like yin yang. Is that not right? I don't know how you say it, but can you talk about the symbol for samurai success and what that means to you? I thought that'd be a fun way to close it out. Nice. Yeah. The yin yang symbol is such a powerful thing. We actually talked about, you know, most of our society thinks about things about this or that. Uh, A lot of this comes from, we don't realize where all these verbiage things come from, but they're part of a story that's been lost, but there's an mm-hmm. idea in the Western philosophy about the coin concept. There's 
same coin, but there's the heads and the tails. Mm. But in our society, we say heads or tails. Wow. So it's an either this or it's wow. that. True. So in the, this physical plane, we have these belief systems that are created around these stories. Like yeah. I can either do this or I can do that. Everything becomes mutually exclusive, which right. you start thinking about choice. Choice is not about that. That's a dilemma. I can either do wow. this or that. Wow. But the other says we have free will and choice. <laughs> nice. And the yin yang symbol, both heads and tails, black and white, are on the same side of the coin. Mm-hmm. And it's just remarkable about, but you know, they're centuries old. They've had access to this knowledge and this spiritual concept that we're seem to be evolving into so beautifully, by the way, that we're looking at different alternatives. So when you all of a sudden you start taking a look at this physical plane with this and philosophy, I've, I've left the world of or, and I'm moving into the world of and, it opens up this breadth of choices that most people don't have access to. But again, that's a mindset. It's a belief wow. system. It's a paradigm shift about yeah. looking at the world, the same world you've been in for, I don't care if you've been here for two minutes or for 80 years, you start looking at it differently. The amount of opportunity that's here is so expansive as long as you're centered around who you are. Wow. Changes the entire dynamic. Totally different quality of life based upon you working on you. Wow. Glad I asked that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, It's been an awesome talking to you more and I'm very, very excited to get back to my book. (laughs) Thank, Thank you so much, David. Very nice to meet you. And thanks again for your time today.